uh, you want uh, to hear a polite answer or if you don't want to know the truth, don't ask an Israeli question. <laughs> we learned a lot from the partners at Y Combinator. They gave us really good advices at the beginning. Hey, this is Sid. I was doing research on the topic of Israel and why the country of Israel is able to produce so many startups successfully. Um, while I was doing research, I felt that I would need to interview someone who is currently building a startup in Israel. So I interviewed Leron, who is the co-founder of Honeydew AI. She talks a lot about her experience at Y Combinator and her experience as a founder in Israel, as well as being a two-time founder. I think you'll really find it interesting to see what she has to say about building from a country like Israel. All right, enjoy. Again, all right. Thank you for joining me. Um, I really appreciate you taking your time to come here. Um, so you went to school at uh, the University of Tel Aviv. I think it says Tel Aviv University, correct? Um, and you did your bachelor's in cinema and TV script writing and then proceeded to do an MBA. Was it a transition that was active where you saw the scene in Israel, uh, the startup scene in Israel, and then you decided to make the switch from an art degree to a more business degree because you wanted to get into startups? No, uh, the, the story is uh, not such a strategic story. Actually, it's a story about a girl that didn't know what she wants to do when she grows up. Um, so... My father, when I was young, she, he always wanted me to study math, physics, uh, computer science, the important subjects, but I didn't really have any passion to those subjects. Uh, and then I, uh, I didn't know what I want to do, and I went to the army. And at the army, I was in intelligence. And okay. my role was uh, capturing and uh, collecting information from other units in order to write a wider story about something, about the situation. Mm. And that's a bit about script writing. And I knew that I was creative and I told my father, okay, I want to, after the army, I need to decide what I want to do with my life. Okay. Oh. I told him I'll study cinema. Um, his face, <laughs> you, you can only imagine. So he said, okay. Not, not immediately, it took him time to actually to adjust it and understand that his uh, daughter is actually going to study cinema and not uh, computer science. Uh, and then he said, okay, uh, but in one condition, uh, afterwards you'll do your MBA. So I said, okay. Um, now I went to study cinema, not because I wanted to be a script writer, it's just because I really didn't know what I want to do. Um, I thought about advertising, something like this. Um, and then I realized that I really have passion for writing. Before that, I had passion for reading. So I, I suddenly started write, writing science fiction. I even didn't know that this thing is inside me. Mm -hmm. uh, but unfortunately, in Israel, you cannot raise money for science fiction films. The budget is too high. And then they tell you, if you want to raise money, you need to write about uh, something realistic, um, like a ordinary drama. And Interesting. this is not really my style, but uh, I try to, to see if there is anything that might be interesting to write about. And back then, and it's really back then, it's like 13 years ago, uh, I I went to a church. I found out a story about uh, refugees from Eritrea, um, and then I started uh, exploring, researching, and writing a movie about 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 them, about their story, which is a very not simple story. Um, and then it got first prize, the Haifa International Film Festival, and. I decided that I don't want to write anymore afterwards. I got my award and I said no. And I did my MBA. And back then when I was doing first year of MBA, I started working in the only job that I could get with a degree in cinema and online gaming. And I really, really, really hated my job. Uh, you, were doing, you were working in online gaming? Yeah. Uh, what were you doing 
there? SEO. Oh, okay. Very like just research, keyword research, nothing special. Um, now I'll give you a, a bit more background. Both of my parents are entrepreneurs. Mm-hmm. So my mother uh, was important, uh, importing marble from China and Italy. And my father was the founder of a company called Alvarion, which is a unicorn, and he invented the WiMAX. So I was grown in a house that parents, my parents did whatever they wanted to do with their life, and they were less of an active uh, parent, but real entrepreneurs. So that was really inspiring. inspiring. And I was stuck with my MBA and uh, with a job that I hated. Now, during that time, I was having a coffee with another friend of mine. And she saw another woman. She saw a bag that she loves, a bag, handbag. She said, oh, my God, I need this handbag. And I'm, okay, just like <laughs> handbag. <laughs> and, and she said, no, 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 you must go to the other woman and you need to ask her where she got it. Okay, I went to the other woman and I asked her, where did you get your, where did you buy it? And the other woman looked at me and said, I don't remember. Lie, right? She's a liar. Yeah. But now from a script writer point of view, that was very interesting. Why did she lie? So I went back home and I told my father, listen, there is a weird need of identifying fashion items from a distance. Now that was 10 years ago. Mm -hmm. And he said, oh, this is really interesting. And we started like working on it, like thinking about it, but like a hobby. I was still working and I was like, it it was like writing another screenplay. I went uh, went and I asked people and I talked to women and I said, oh, do you look at fashion items from the day? on other people and you want to buy it and they said yes of course and I wasn't this type of woman I was wearing my clothes and I didn't care what other people were wearing Uh, but that was really interesting and I realized that there is a real need and then I left my job and that hobby became to be my first startup aware it was identifying fashion items from a distance and we pivoted and we did frequent flyer for fashion, something else, uh, same area. <clears throat> I lost you for a second. No, no worries. And, and then I asked my father to be my chairman. So the last startup last seven years died with COVID, but that was a real adventure. And for your question, when I raised money to my first startup and I was a solo founder and a female founder, um, this is ask me what the connection between cinema and being an entrepreneur. Mm-hmm. And I, I told them what's the connection between engineering and being an entrepreneur, because in cinema, I needed to think about an idea to raise money for that idea. So I needed to make an investor deck for a vision and the vision needed to be winning the Oscar. And then I needed to gather a team. And then I needed to gather information and then I needed to write, uh, write it. And then I needed to leave it like it was part of me. Um, and this is doing a startup. So now I know that the degree I was doing back then is very relevant to what I'm doing now. But then I didn't know that this is going to be my future. Understood. Okay. So there's like some inspiration from your family, but also the creativity that you got from your degree and your natural keen to problem solving, like a lot of things just coming together to it. It wasn't like an active decision, but it just turned out to be this way. Exactly. Yeah, that's beautiful. So you said you worked on Airware and now you're at Honeydew AI. So if you had to describe, you already described uh, Airware, um, but if you want to go into more details and also describe Honeydew, uh, how would you describe each of them? So Airware was really simple, frequent flyer for fashion. The more you wear your clothes, the more points you get. 
because we built a platform that we said that any person who wears a logo is the brand ambassador and he should get money for doing it. And it involved hardware and software and lots of complexity, mainly with hardware problems, like how to make a chip that is really small embedded inside the garments, but business problem as well. How you um, convince a fashion brand CEO to to change his production line and embed those chips inside the production line. And how do you uh, convince users to download an app and activate the item and give you the data mm-hmm. about how they're using. And Honeydew is a shared source of proofs for data teams. So basically we're building a platform and we make sure that uh, anyone in the company is working on the same KPIs. We learned that companies are doing bad decisions just because the uh, business terms like active user or churn are not defined correctly or there is disagreement about how you calculate them. Um, and I saw on your LinkedIn that you're an analyst, right? I am an analyst, yep. <laughs> <laughs> so this is resonating with me. I'm, I'm, you're, bringing back, you're bringing me back to work right now, so... <laughs> Sorry about it. I'm so sorry for doing it. Um, So uh, how did you end up coming to that problem statement that companies are not using the same, uh, they're not sharing the same truth and they're not using the same KPI? So first we're three co-founders and all of us experience from our past experience exactly the same uh, uh, problem. So David Krakow is the CEO and he was the co-founder of a startup called Verada. He got acquired by Starburst and they did data lake acceleration. Baruch Hoxman is the CTO and he was uh, the first employee of a startup that got acquired by Salesforce and he was building Einstein for sales. So we tackled the problem from a different angle And myself, at Aware, we were selling data to fashion brands. So when I was talking to fashion brands executives, I saw how they took their own decisions and I saw them not trusting the data and not trusting their data analysts and putting millions of dollars on wrong campaigns, not based on data, just because the numbers in the end of the day, they did, they just got different numbers. So they said, okay, I don't believe him. I don't believe you. This is my decision. And companies were really not data driven. And the problem is much deeper than the, you see the problem, the result of the problem with the executives, but the problem starts like down there with the data analysts. Yeah. Okay. And and then after we, after we thought about it and each one of us experienced this problem. So because it's the second startup of all of us. We said, okay, we're not writing anything. We're not doing a product. First thing we wanted to do is talking to strangers, to data analysts, engineers, team leaders, chief data officers. And we just had cold calls on LinkedIn with over 200 uh, data people and asked them if they experienced this challenge and what they're doing now to solve it. We realized that we have something once they told us, okay, We know you don't have a product, but once you have a product, we want it now because this problem (laughs) is huge for me and I suffer from it. And then we said, okay, so we're on something. It's not just our own problem. So let's start building. Wow. 200 people. That's a, that's a lot of people to call, call, but yeah, yeah. I guess, um, the ethos to Y Combinator is to be talking to your customers. Um, So by the time you guys had joined Y Combinator and stuff, had you guys already started working on the idea and talking to customers? And when did you decide to join Y Combinator? So again, like all the good things, it happens by chance, but uh, uh, we already like started building a product. We had early customers and we were working together. And then a friend of mine, was in a previous batch and he said, you should apply to Y Combinator. And I said, okay, they're awesome. They're really smart people there. We'll apply. We'll, we'll probably not 
get in, but we'll give it a shot. And we applied and we already raised our pre-seed round. And then uh, they told us that we got in and we were really excited about this opportunity. I see. So you guys had already raised money before Y Combinator. And yeah. then you guys got another pre-seed round from Y Combinator as well. Yeah. More like a seed, yes. Got it. Got it. And um, so you guys, when you guys uh, joined Y Combinator, did you stay in Israel or did you have to fly to San Francisco and work there? So we all have uh, small kids. My, I have two, five years old and three years old. And David and uh, Baruch have small kids as well. So we rotate. We Once a week, one of us was flying and uh, we met our mentors and batchmates. I see. Back and forth. <laughs> makes sense. That makes sense. And uh, so I guess you guys are from Israel. You guys grew up in Israel. Is that what were there other reasons for you guys to set camp in Israel? And you guys are in Tel Aviv, right? Yeah. So uh, uh, what are some of the reasons that you guys thought it was logical to be in Tel Aviv as a company and set up there? So we're all from Israel. The company is a corporate in the US. Mm -hmm. So, but we're in Israel and Israel and Tel Aviv is basically the startup nation. There is lots of technology here, lots of very talented developers here. So once you want to hire, there are good developers to hire here, lots of entrepreneurs and lots of investors. So it's like a small, small, Tel Aviv is like a small country of high tech. You can grab coffee and see next to you the Fiverr CEO or Gong CEO. And you can get to whoever you want to get here. And there are really a lot of unicorns here. Yeah. So at, at the beginning of the lifetime of the company, it's good for us to be in Israel because lots of unicorns, are, they are our customers. So once you're building a product, you want design partners that are close to you. And mm -hmm. another bonus, Israelis are very direct. They don't say that something is wonderful if it's not wonderful. If it's shit, they tell you this is shit. So, and this is a way to build a good product. So being physical next to them and getting this feedback that sometimes is not nice to hear, but it's necessary for us to improve our product. Well, um, I have been reading the book Startup Nation throughout the weekend before preparing to talk to you too. And the book often mentions um, this, uh, we call it chutzpah. Um, nice. And... And, and I was like, I, I wasn't too sure whether this was true because it kept em emphasizing on chutzpah. And I was like, you mentioning this without me even saying it is, uh, I think, a true testament to how much the bluntness of Israeli people towards each other helps to build startups. I totally was not expecting that. Um, so I'm guessing I being... I didn't read the book, so tell me if it's a good one. I might read it. It, it is in 2009 and a lot of information is about like the history, the military influence and the R&D that's available in uh, Israel. There's also uh, the discussion about clusters. So like a bunch of concentration of people that work into startups. So like you said, you can just be going to get coffee and you'll run into other CEOs. So um, or if you're in design, you'll run into another designer and you guys are speaking the same language. So you guys are more efficient into building in that space. And you guys are more efficient at like exchanging information as well. Um, so that's, that's why I'm like also trying to learn more from you, whether like, is, is that still true in 2023 as well? If you want to, if you if uh, you want uh, to hear a polite answer, or if you don't want to know the truth, don't ask an Israeli question. <laughs> I can tell you whatever he thinks, and we first talk, and then we think, and then we say, "Oh God, what have we done?" But uh, it's too late. So I see. So you guys are 
pre-built to be tough and to be able to hear these answers if you guys are choosing to become entrepreneurs. Um, so do you think that Honeydew benefits? So Honeydew, now I'm guessing your answer would be yes if I ask you if benefit if Honeydew benefits from being in Israel. Yeah, because okay. of the customers, unicorns, investors, the ecosystem. Oh, that's perfect. Um, so are there things in Israel that are missing for, based on your two startup experiences? Are there things in Israel that are missing that would help you to be more efficient as a founder, as someone who's running a company, hiring people, like anything related to building your company? Do you think Israel could do better at one specific thing? I think for, for early stage, it's wonderful. Because once you try to realize what is your target market, we are in the middle of the globe. Five hours, we're in London. Five hours, we're in India. Like US, 10 hours. So it's really close to, it's really the center. And again, lots of density of unicorns and companies that you can work with. In the future, you need to, as a company, you need to understand the, where are your customers and if the customers are in the US or if the customers are in Europe or in India, you need to, to think about it, whether Israel is the right place to, to be. But for early stage, it's definitely a good place to be. Understood. Um, uh, there was a part in the book uh, that I was reading where they were saying that VCs would help connect um, founders to the United States market or any international market. Um, would you say that beyond the growth stage, at some point, you guys have to be on your own or you guys have to move back to move to somewhere outside of Israel to maintain like a company beyond the growth stage? I think it depends with the company and it depends with the product. Um, the VC is connecting, they're connecting. The American VCs that invested in us or the Israelis are connecting. And again, it depends what who is the, the partner and if he wants to help you because sometimes VCs just write a check and give you the check and they don't care what happens with you. They just want to see results in the end. So mm. us as a company, we chose from whom to take money and we chose our investors based on them as people because we learned that money, you can take money from anyone, but you want that the money will be more smart money that will help you to grow mm -hmm. and again it depends with the company and with us i don't know if we'll be still in israel next year or move to somewhere else now it's a good place for us but again depends where is the market customers where is the product understood understood um so you also i mean you i, I guess you already mentioned this i was going to ask you if um, you serving in the military helped in becoming a better founder? I think this is one unique thing for Israelis. It helped because imagine you just finished high school and now you're 18. Me in the age of 18, I did a combat basic training and I was staying for three months in the desert in a tent. Then I moved from that and I'm 18. I'm, I'm a kid, basically. Then I moved to intelligence. And I needed to take really important decisions that could affect other people's lives. And this is a huge responsibility. And then you get matured. So you become resilient. You know how to talk to other people to get your information. So you become more outgoing and you need to use your elbows if you want, if you need something fast or something is important and someone else is busy. So you don't care that he's busy because someone other people lives is depend on it so you you're again a kid and you need to do anything you can just to take this information and move it forward i think it helped to be a better entrepreneur well that's a that's a really good answer that uh yeah people's lives depends on it because in more bureaucratic environments it's like you're trying to not step on people's toes too much and you're not trying to disturb people if they're busy but if something needs to get done, it needs to get done. Um, 
And uh, just one last question. I was going to ask you about uh, the VCs, but you already answered that just now. Um, just one last question. How was your time at Y Combinator being abroad? I think we, we, we learned a lot from the partners at Y Combinator. They gave us really good advice. At the beginning, we saw that our goal to market need to be more PLG. And they, they didn't agree with us. And they said, you need to be B2B, which was right. But we thought something else. So we learned a lot from the partners. We were once in two or three, three weeks in San Francisco. So I have friends from the batch. And this is very valuable because these people are helping me now. And we have virtual copies and we're meeting virtually. It probably would be better to stay there, but due to the uh, circumstances of being with being a parent, you cannot leave your family, even though there were entrepreneurs that left their family and uh, I really appreciate them, but they left their family and went to Y Combinator and uh, stayed there for three months. Wow. Fascinating. So you do benefit from the network and the advice that you got from them. That's beautiful. Yeah. That's, that's great. Um, I think that's a lot of information that I just got from you. Um, you confirmed a lot of what I learned from the book that I just read and also about Israeli life as a founder. I mean, from having parents that were entrepreneurs to that inspiring you throughout your journey, through people around you being entrepreneurial as well. And I think this is a lot of good stuff. Um, I really appreciate you for giving me all this insight through this interview. Thank you for inviting me, Sid. I really appreciate it. Is there anything you'd like to plug throughout this interview? Or... If you have a problem at your organization with a shared source of truth, so come and talk to us. All right, honeydew.ai. I will include the link in the description for the video. Thank you. All right. Thank you so much. I'll stop the recording.